to cover something to follow through what I covered last time. Last week, as you know, I spoke on breakthrough prayer, certain keys to help you really have breakthroughs to God, to get through to God more powerfully than you might have been able to in the past. And today, I was preparing, and I thought, this is very simple. I know all about this, and I was preparing right up to the last minute because it's a type of subject I guess we could go on for about five hours on, but I want to talk to you about keys to Bible study, just special keys to really understanding the Bible. So this is entitled, Vital Keys to Understanding the Bible. And I think it's important that we go into that in connection with prayer because as I mentioned last time, and most of you realize this, you brethren and I, we cannot pray as profoundly as we should or as intelligently as we should if we don't also study the Bible. We've got to let God talk to us and we've got to read those examples of prayer in the Bible constantly to know how we then should respond to God and how we should talk to God. And so the two go hand in hand. And I have had other thoughts in mind, of course, about prophecy or other doctrines or going through a book. But uh, Mr. Davis suggested, and I asked one or two others as well, and they thought it was a very, very good idea to simply follow through with a sermon on Bible study. I'm not going to spend quite as much time on the general normal things, let's call them, that we have written about and talked about, but it is important to review those keys, but uh, we will do that briefly. Remember always, brethren, Luke 4, verse 4, Jesus Christ said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. In one sense, that's the basis of all Christianity. You can say Christianity has a lot of things, of course. It's letting Christ live his life within us, as I bring out, too. You can say Christianity is love, or love toward God and love toward man. It's all those things. But all that goes back to what? To the Word of God. Otherwise, we wouldn't know the mind of God. We wouldn't have those other verses even to refer to. So we are to study the Bible. Jesus said, of course, we're to live by every word of God. And you cannot and I cannot even start to begin to commence to live by every word of God unless we study the word of God, not carelessly read it, but actually study it and go over and over to make it part of ourselves. There's no way I can live by God's word and really know what I'm doing unless I read this book regularly. Think about it. Compare one scripture with the other. Go over and over it until I can understand what God is trying to tell me. And you can't do it either. We've all got to study the Bible because it is, brethren, as you know, the revelation of the mind of the one who gives us life and breath. And I could go through a bunch of references about how William Tyndale and many other martyrs literally were burned alive or tortured in order to be willing to produce this book in our modern times into the English language. Other men in the past have gone through things. It was precious to them. They gave their lives to bring us the Bible as we now know it. And yet a lot of us take it for granted, and we will let days go by without even reading the Bible. And I'm saying this to you in this room, and I'm saying this to you brethren around the world who may hear this in the next three to six or seven weeks later on. We as a church had better become the church of the book. You know, people talk about uh, this is the, the uh, people of the book, that is the Jewish people, which, of course, is not necessarily true. A lot of them don't study the Bible or even follow their Old Testament teachings. But we better believe and be the people of the book, the people that drink into this book and feed upon it and are filled with it and are filled with and led by the Spirit of God and the truths of God based on the Bible. This is very, very important. Most Protestants don't even begin to start to commence to understand the Bible. And as we brought out in so many of our articles, one I was reviewing a quote recently that I've reused a couple times out of the U.S. News and World Report magazine. This religion writer, after following a lot of surveys and doing a lot of talking to religious leaders and people in various Protestant churches, it says, he said it's not the Americans don't believe anything, they believe everything. 
They read a little bit here and a little bit there, and they'll adapt a little bit from the, you know, Mormons or the Adventists or the Confucianists or the Hindus or the whatever. They just pick up these ideas from philosophy and New Age thinking, and they all blend it together in a kind of a blender, like you women have a blender in your kitchen. A lot of people do that, or they have a cafeteria religion. They don't understand the Bible. They do not understand it. We in this church had better really understand it if we intend to be in the kingdom of God that Jesus Christ talked about. Turn, if you would, first of all, our first regular scripture I'm going to refer to, to 2 Timothy, if you would. 2 Timothy, and I'm going to begin in chapter 3. 2 Timothy, a very, of course, fundamental scripture you should all know. Second Timothy, brethren, chapter 3, and I'm going to begin reading in verse 12. I want to kind of give you the feeling of the story flow here. Paul wrote to Timothy, yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Why? Well, because we really do what this book says, and the world does not. It's a whole different way of life, as you know. But evil men and apostles. They'll get better and better because, as Bill Bright wrote, there's going to be a great big Protestant revival at the time of the end. Oh, really? No, there's not. A lot of these Protestants think they're going to bombard the world with their idea and the whole world will be converted. No, Paul says, and the entire Bible shows, evil men will get worse and worse until the nations of this world, literally hundreds of millions of people, will be ready to fight Christ at his second coming as you read in Revelation 17. Think about the implications of that. That is just awful. These people are so blinded that hear all these trumpet plagues the Bible talks about, and finally the seventh trump sounds, and they are so blinded that they get together to literally fight the returning Christ. That's just awesome when you think about how blinded these people are. Evil men shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. They themselves are deceived. Most of these preachers, most of these priests, most of these rabbis, of course, they don't know the Bible at all. And as some of my own friends whom I've been very close to in the past have told me who've attended outside Protestant seminaries and some of them have master's degrees and doctor's degrees, most of the leading theologians today who teach in the major seminaries or we used to call them Protestant cemeteries, <laughs> cemeteries, not seminaries, but anyway, they bury the Bible there. Most of them are very liberal, and they themselves do not believe that the Bible was really inspired at all. Many of them are, as one man said, agnostic. The top teachers, the top religious professors, they think there might be a God. They think there might be a real God. They won't close their mind to that possibility but they're not really sure that there's even a real God, let alone the fact that God literally inspired the Bible. So when you understand, as you read today, for instance, in the religion section of the, uh, it's called Carolina Living, of the local paper at the bottom of the front page, it talks about this new bishop named after my sister. Her name is Catherine, something or other. And they've got a new Episcopalian bishop who's a woman. Now, I'm not against women. I love my wife. I love my daughters. I want my daughters and granddaughters to be successful. But the way to be successful is not for a woman to be a preacher. And I think we all understand that. That's directly contradictory to the Word of God in every possible way. And yet these people have gone so far that they're having a woman as a bishop. And they're having these homosexuals, these sexual perverts, as priests and ministers, and some of them as bishops in these Protestant churches. That is an abomination in the sight of the great God. That is totally directly contrary to everything this book talks about. How can they do that? Because they simply trash the Bible. That's why they take the Bible and they hurl it into the nearest trash can, figuratively speaking. They care nothing about this, what this book says, unless it just gives them some sort of an inspirational feeling, and unless they happen to agree with some of its ideas and their own human philosophy. We need to understand it. I'm not exaggerating. That's the way literally thousands of modern ministers are and millions of their followers by their actions, by their fruits, you know them. Is God blessing them? No. Their churches are coming apart. 
Their way of life is coming apart. This whole nation, which has on its coins, in God we trust, it's coming apart. And God is beginning to intervene and shake this nation, such as he's never shaken any nation in modern history, along with the Canadians and the British and the peoples of Israel. So we need to understand that. It's not for no reason that God's going to do these things at all. They do not believe in the word of God. They are deceived and being deceived. But as for you, continuing the things which you've been taught, taught and assured of, knowing that from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood, he tells Timothy, and remember this was written to the young evangelist Timothy, and the only scriptures available to Timothy back then when Paul wrote this were the Old Testament, as we call it, the Torah, the Old Testament Bible. That's all they had. From childhood, you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise to salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All Scripture. And, of course, later on, Paul refers to certain letters, certain phrases that Jesus gave as Scripture. And Peter refers to Paul's letter in 2 Peter chapter 3 as Scriptures. Paul has written, as in all the Scriptures, he says in first, or 2 Peter 3, the New Testament is Scripture. All Scripture is God-breathed. Remember again that word, brethren, and the Protestants and their scholars, they all know that. That's what this Greek word means, inspired, God breathed, God directly dictated these words. These are not the vague ideas or something that might have been sort of generally come from God because he sort of put good feelings in these men's hearts and they somehow wrote something out of their imagination they thought might be good. Not that way at all. These words were directly God breathed and it's profitable for doctrine it's the Bible is to get, teach us our ideas of truth, of the whole purpose of human existence and the way of life, for correction. And brethren, please remember that that's one of the major purposes of the Bible. But as I think about all my friends back in the Methodist church I grew up in, and I talked to some of them after I began to learn, did any of them ever change on any of those things? Not one that I'm aware of. They just don't. They're in their church. They're in their social club and they don't change, they don't grow, they don't let the Bible correct them for reproof, You're to take reproof from the Bible for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Do you need the Book of Mormon? No. Do you need Mary Baker Eddy's uh, Science and Key to the Scriptures from the Christian Scientists? No. Do you need these various books and tracts from the Jehovah Witnesses? No. Do you need the Bhagavad Gita? Do you need the books of Islam? You know, no. The Bible completely equips you for every good work. You don't need any other religious books. And as we've explained a number of times for many, many decades actually, the original Bible, the way it was laid out in the Old Testament, and Jesus put his imprimatur on it in the 22nd chapter of Luke, or it's the 24th chapter, and we're near the end of Luke, he talks about the Psalms, the prophets, and the writings. And of course, he's talking here about uh, the law, the prophets, and the writings. He's talking about the threefold division of the Bible as the Jews had it, and the way they had it, which is indicated in a number of scriptures in the New Testament, it was 22 books. 22 books. Get that if you haven't seen that and noticed it before. How many books in the New Testament? 27. 27 and 22 are what? 7 times 7. 7 is the number of completion. 7 is the number of perfection. You don't need any other books. You don't need all this other stuff that people come up with. It's not wrong to hear a sermon. It's not wrong to read our articles which are written sermons to help you look into and prove certain things out of the Bible, but no other book. Some one religious leader of recent date has tried to indicate like Mr. Armstrong's book on the mystery of the ages is kind of like a New Testament, and he makes his followers read that and agree that they understand and believe all of that. Mr. Armstrong never did that. I was right there, and Mr. Ames was, and Mr. Apartin, when he was writing the book, and he'd sometimes read parts of it, and, say, well, and then he said a number of times, he said, fellows, this is not inspired of God, I know that, 
It's just sort of a compilation of the major things that I've taught through my life. And he tried to put it together. And it's a very wonderful book. It has three or four errors that are obvious if you read it carefully. One major error it has was the fact that he implies four or five times that God's purpose was to create the angels and they would be ruling the world and the whole universe and the creation of man was plan B. Now that's wrong. And if Herman Hay or I or Mr. Ames had happened to be there with him and explain as he used to read these things to us when he was writing them, we would have said, well, Mr. Armstrong and tried to go through it. Oh, yeah. But at that time, he was not advised by these people around him and by the young man just taking his dictation, and he made that error. And Mr. Armstrong would acknowledge that today. I'm just saying that. I, I had him do that and back down dozens of times when Herman Hay and I would point out some particular thing where he made an error. But we're not going to tell you people, you've got to read Mystery of the Ages like some inspired New Testament. It is not an inspired New Testament, but it is a wonderful book. Very helpful, except for that one important error, and then some little tiny errors that are not nearly as important. But it's not perfect, and no work of man is perfect. Nothing I have ever written is perfect. So you have to understand that. But the Bible is perfect. The Bible was directly God-breathed, and we do need to understand that and appreciate that. Completely unique, different from any other book. So the Bible was inspired and is God-breathed and profitable for correction, instruction, that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped, not partially equipped, for every good work. You turn back to chapter 2 now, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. Be diligent, Paul told this young evangelist. And it means all of us too, obviously. God put it in the inspired revelation to us. To present yourself self-approved to God, a workman who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So you're to zealously study the Bible and rightly divide the word of truth. Learn to do it by studying, by analyzing, by asking God on your knees, as Mr. Armstrong used to do, give me understanding. And he did have more understanding of the whole purpose of God and of God's way of life than any other man in modern times, and we're very grateful for that. And that he gave us the keys. And yet while he was alive, he willingly was willing to change if we pointed out little errors that he would make along the way. And that's, again, a sign of a converted man. I've seen him do that and done that with me. And Herman Hay and I were the main editors for about 20 years. And he would do that continually if we pointed out some little point of misunderstanding that he had. And he pointed out a lot more errors that we made, too. I'm sure we made many more than he did. So you don't misunderstand. So we're to let the Bible teach us, correct us, and study the Bible. Now, I want to give you uh, four major keys here, or five keys, to really understand the Bible more deeply. First of all, the first major key is to hunger, hunger for God, and study the Bible, therefore, and take correction. Hunger for God. Proverbs chapter 1 and verse 7 God says here, the fear of the ever-living one is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. And brethren, that's the starting point. If you hunger for God, if you have an awe for God, and you want to know the will of your Creator, and you're willing to listen then, and not be a fool, fool despise wisdom and instruction. You've got to learn not to do that, but to study the Bible and be willing to learn from it. Chapter 2, Proverbs 2, verse 1. My son, if you receive my words, not just hear them, but receive them. Think about them. Take them into your mind and heart. And treasure, get this, treasure my commands. You appreciate them. You treasure this word. Men have died to preserve this word. And you treasure my commands within you so that you incline your ear to wisdom and you apply your heart to understanding. Yes, if you cry out for discernment, oh God, help me understand. And so you're in that fervent prayer crying out for discernment, you see, passionate prayer about it. Please give me understanding. That's what God is indicating here. You cry out for discernment and lift up your voice, you see, in heartfelt prayer for understanding. 
If you seek her as silver, search for her as hidden treasures, then you will understand the fear of the eternal. You'll understand how to serve God and honor God and find the knowledge of God. What is the knowledge of God? Everything. Everything basic that you need to know as a human being to fulfill the purpose of your creator, the purpose for which you're drawing breath. For the eternal gives wisdom. From his mouth come knowledge and understanding. So have that attitude as you study the Bible. That, of course, is very, very important to have an attitude of teachableness, of deep humility and passion and willingness to take correction as you study the Bible. Willingness to learn something new. Willingness to change. The second major key is to employ, to use different methods of Bible study and different Bible helps. Now, we could and have in classes devoted whole classes to this, of course, an ambassador. We don't have time to go through all of that in a regular sermon here. But just here's some things. In other words, uh, 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 one, the, key, the first way to study the Bible, methods of study, is to read right through. I just call it read right through or the book method. In other words, get the New Testament would be my recommendation and read right through Matthew and then Mark and then Luke and then John and then Acts and then Romans and so forth. It might be good to remember the original inspired order that God had in the Byzantine text was Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts. And the next book God put next actually was the book of James. Interesting how the early Catholic Church and later the Protestants put Paul's writings right after Acts, which kind of are confusing to people because you find Jesus talking about the commandments of God, and then you find Paul apparently changing things and putting them down. Whereas if you had stayed with the original inspired order found in the received text, the Byzantine text, then you would have James coming next, which would tell you to keep God's commandments and you break one point of the law, and you break them all, and telling you a way of obedience. James. And then you would have First and Second Peter, which tell you the same thing in essence. And then you would have John, the disciple Jesus loved, who says that over and over and over. If there's any progressive revelation, John would have done away with the commandments, because he wrote last of all. But did he? No. He says, he that says, I know him and keeps not his commandments is a liar. And the truth is not in him. Remember that, 1 John chapter 2 and verse 4. He says back in chapter 5, verse 3, 1 John 5, 3, For this is, oh, the Protestants say, oh, you've got to have love. you just got to have love, okay? Let's have it. What is it? 1 John 5, 3, This is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, plural. Not Jesus' commandments, the antecedent the word it refers to is God, God, not Jesus, although Jesus is God for the sake of argument, but for the sake of argument who Protestants who try to say Jesus had a different set of commandments. No, he did not. He did not. This is the love of God that we keep his, God's commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. They are not grievous, as one of the translations have, but they're not too hard. What's the one they pick on the most? We've given you this before, but it's good to think about it from time to time. The one they, give, they, they have the hardest time with is the Sabbath. And yet, brethren, as I've told you, when I was in Ambassador College for all those years, and Mr. Ames was and the rest of it, which was the commandment that was easiest to keep once people are generally keeping the commandments? Well, the Sabbath. Only one day a week you need to rest and to refrain from your own work and so forth. That's a lot easier than all day long Telling an 18, 19, 20-year-old boy, don't ever lust, okay? Don't ever lie. Don't ever, you see what I mean? All day long, seven days a week, 24 hours a day. That's a lot harder to keep that commandment in the spirit than to keep the Sabbath. The Sabbath is one of the easiest commandments to keep. But the devil has a way of twisting things right around, and he tries to make it the hardest. So read right through the Bible and if you start out with Matthew, then, of course, you read the Sermon on the Mount and all the scriptures that tell you to keep the commandments and so on. And it becomes very clear what Christ taught if you're trying to think, what did Jesus actually teach? Now, brethren, another point about that first method of Bible study, this is the method of Bible study employed overwhelmingly by Jesus himself and the apostles. 
How dare I say that? Well, because most of them did not have, in fact, practically none of them had the whole Bible. They didn't have the whole Old Testament, as we call it, all laid out, all 22 books. They would get the scroll of Isaiah or the scroll of this and even then often have to go to the synagogue to read even that much. They couldn't turn back and forth. There weren't concordances. There weren't topical Bibles. They didn't have all these helps to zip around and grab verses here and there. They simply had to read through the book of Isaiah, and they had powerful memories back there. They had no TV to distract them, no radio, no computer, so they read and they studied. And you read about how they used to train the rabbis, and they drill and drill and drill and so on. So they would remember and even memorize vast portions of the Old Testament because it was something they drilled on, and they didn't have all the distractions we have. But they didn't read a little bit here and a little bit there, so they read right through the book of Isaiah. They read, read right through an order, no doubt, the Torah, you know, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. They just read right through. That was the main method of study. I think that's the best method, frankly. You get the whole picture. You get the overview. You get the flavor and when you come to a certain passage, you know, that you can't understand, often if you just keep on reading or read a book later on, then you get the understanding. For instance, back here in, uh, in Matthew, I'll turn occasionally apart from my notes to something to illustrate a point. And uh, this is in Matthew 16, as I remember. Turn to Matthew 16, and here at the end of the book, he says in verse, uh, into the chapter of Matthew 16, 28, Assuredly, I say to you, Jesus said, there are some standing here who shall not taste of death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. And I have even read commentaries who go on and puzzle what could this mean. I mean commentaries. But all you have to do is just keep on reading. Just keep on reading. Remember, brethren, men divided these books into chapters. There weren't chapters back there anyway. It was just the long book of Isaiah, the scroll of Matthew. So you keep on reading. Some men, who? What does it mean? Now, after six days, chapter 17, no chapter break in the original, Jesus took Peter. Peter's always mentioned first, always. Peter, James, and John, his brethren, brought them up to a high mountain and was transfigured before them meaning he was taken apart and looked a different way as he would look in the kingdom of God. Jesus said you would see the kingdom of God, so in this vision they did. And his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as light. And then they came back down, and they were wondering what all this meant. And back in verse, down in verse 9, Jesus commanded them, verse 9, tell the vision to no one till the Son of Man is risen from the dead. What was this? Well, right away after Jesus said, some of you will see the kingdom of God, he took some of them, three of them, up, and he, they saw him in a vision as he will appear, you see, in the kingdom of God. Just keep on reading. Many times the Bible will just clear it up if you just keep on reading. But often people stop and they act confused. Well, what does this mean? Because they don't read the whole thing. They just read a little bit here and there. So that's a very important thing, the, the, the uh, read right through method. And it gives you the overview, and frankly, it gives you the overall flavor of the Bible and the mind of God rather than skipping around. The second best method is subject study, subject study or topical study. And we can do that today so much more easy than they could because we have concordances and we have topical Bibles like Naves, by the way, N A V E. That's N as in noon, N-A-V-E apostrophe S is probably the best one, the best topical, Naves topical Bible. Very thorough and very good. It doesn't list everything Strong's Exhaustive Concordance has, but you don't have to go through near as many references to get to the truth on most subjects. Naves topical Bible is a good reference on that. So you can look up heaven, or you can look up hell, or you can look up law, or you can look up commandments, or you can look up Sabbath, or whatever. Now, the only weakness with some of those things is that knaves or some commentaries, of course, don't agree with our teaching on that, so they may leave out key scriptures occasionally on those kind of subjects. Nevertheless, if you get a concordance, like Strong's Exhaustive Concordance, or even Young's Analytical Concordance, it will cover virtually all the verses on heaven, or hell, or immortality, or whatever you're studying. 
And that will, get you a, that will give you a quickie way to check up on what does the Bible say, all the Bible on heaven, all the Bible on the word immortality. Every place is used, there it is. Very fine method of Bible study to supplement the first approach, the read right through approach. The third uh, way to study the Bible, or another way to be helpful, of course, is to use Bible uh, uh, dictionaries and commentaries and other Bible helps. And I don't always recommend, but just quickly to help you, there are many things we've recommended in our literature. I just do you giving you some of the ones that I found the most helpful. I recommend the uh, New Ungers, U-N-G-E-R apostrophe S, the New Ungers Bible Dictionary. I think that's one of the best because it's conservative. It doesn't try to wander into all the list. Liberalism is very helpful. Also, the uh, critical and experimental commentary, the critical and experimental commentary of the Bible. It explains verse by verse, you know, the ver meaning as they understand it. And then, of course, another one, if you're writing these down, is the new, the new Bible commentary revised. That's probably the best one-volume commentary ever produced, the new Bible commentary revised. Very helpful. And again, conservative. It doesn't jump the track very often, uh, except in the way they all do. And then Halley's Handbook, or Haley's, however it's pronounced, H-A-L-L-E-Y, Haley's Pocket Bible Handbook. That's very helpful, just a simplistic kind of layout as to when the book was written, the geographical and historical background, and, and so on. Gives you a little bit of idea of what's in a book very quickly. Those are some very helpful things. Now, brethren, there are three areas where nearly all the Bible helps jump the track. <laughs> I say to use them and yet warn them, warn you, because you know about 90% of all of them, or 95%, were written by Protestants. So obviously they have their Protestant bias. Whenever they come to the nature and destiny of man, they jump the track. That is, when they go into the immortality idea, then they think we are an immortal soul. When they talk about heaven, they think we go to heaven. So you have to realize that bias. Also, when you come to, of course, obedience. Anything about obedience, most of them don't cover it properly. They may tell you to live a good life. Some of them say that, or even mention the word commandments. But they virtually never tell you to keep all the commandments because they know that they can't, don't, and don't believe that. So they'll water down anything about the Ten Commandments. They've always got a way of kind of shifting and watering it down. That's their teaching. Also on prophecy, they nearly always jump the track on prophecy. Why? Because, again, a good understanding, have they that do his commandments, it tells us back in Psalm 11, 111, verse 10, and they don't have a good understanding of prophecy. They don't understand that the prophecies go right on through it in an orderly manner as the rest of the Bible, and they'll put you know, places here and there out of, out of order and all, all the time they do that. And, of course, a major thing they misunderstand is the key as to the identity of Israel. And when you understand that whenever the Bible says house of Israel, it is not talking about the Jews. It's either talking about the ten tribes or occasionally when it's talking about all being together or before the split, it's talking about all twelve tribes. I'll go into that later. That's a major key they do not understand. So they always get mixed up on prophecy. But except for those three areas, they're, they're very helpful on all kinds of technical points and background material and Christian living in general and so on. All right, you can use those Bible uh, uh, study methods and then those helps and other helps you can find from our other ministers or from our written material. The third major key I want to give you, without dwelling too long on these basic ones, is let the Bible interpret its own symbols. And again, we have given you that many times, but many people don't understand what we mean by that, I understand. So let's go and see what we mean. Turn to Revelation, brethren, if you would. Revelation chapter 1. Revelation, the book of Revelation, and we'll go to chapter uh, uh, 1. And uh, try to find here my marking. Revelation 1 and verse 12. Here it shows Christ in power, and he turned to John, and John turned to see a voice that spoke with me, and having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands, and I saw in the midst of the seven lampstands, Revelation chapter 1, verse 13, one like the Son of Man. 
So this person looked like Christ, this being clothed with the garment down to the feet and girded about the chest with the golden band. His head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes like a flame of fire. His feet were like fine brass, as if refined in a furnace, and his voice was the sound of many waters, like the huge waves crashing up in the big Sur country in Northern California. Come and go, who whoom! And it just creates a huge explosion of sound across the whole beach for a long ways. A powerful sound, Christ's voice like rolling thunder. He had in his right hand seven stars out of his mouth. When he went right, he had in his right hand seven stars, period. Out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. So his face looked like blazing sun. This is the way Jesus Christ looks today. Digressing a little bit, but you know, that's the reason God tells us we're not to have any picture, any representation of God. You can't take that mighty power of being who's, whose voice would literally shake the earth and whose face is like the sun in full strength and put that inside of a picture frame. That's ridiculous. You cannot do that, must not do that. That's why all these pictures of Christ I saw right at the front of the church as I grew up were wrong. And all these other pictures in the Protestant Bible, little Lord Jesus, and all these pictures of this effeminate-looking Christ with long hair, look very unmasculine, very weak, and all the rest of it, they're wrong. They should not be there, their form of idolatry. This is the way Christ looks. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet. He said, don't be afraid, I'm the first and the last, and I'll live forevermore. Write these things which you have seen, and uh, the things which are and will be. Then he says in verse 29, the mystery, I'm sorry, verse 20, the mystery of the seven stars. All right, you look back in chapter, uh, this chapter, and, and it says a little bit earlier uh, about, in verse uh, 16, seven stars. What are these stars? Again, many Protestants come up with all kinds of ideas, what they think these stars are. Well, why not let the Bible say what the stars are? It does just a few verses later. The seven stars are he says, the angels of the seven churches. And the seven golden lampstands are the seven churches. The Bible identifies it. it. It points out and identifies and explains and interprets its own symbols. Let the Bible interpret its own symbols. That is very important as a key. You read also in Revelation 12. Let's turn to Revelation chapter 12 if you would. And here, brethren, again, many people get these things mixed up. Now a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun. It goes on to describe this woman fleeing into the wilderness and, you know, the rest of it here in chapter 12. Then in Revelation 17, you find another woman described. Revelation 17, verse 1. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls, as which contained the seven last plagues, came and talked with me, saying, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great whore, as the King James has it, the great harlot who sits on many waters. And who is this great whore? Who is this harlot? Well, again, people use their imagination. They don't know, many of them. Well, let the Bible interpret the Bible. You read on and you see this is obviously a great religious system sitting on a great civil system, which, you know, the Bible clearly identifies when you study it as the Roman Empire. In chapter 12, Revelation 12 is obviously indicating the true church of God, which had to flee to safety during the dark ages and will have to again. But back in Ephesians chapter 5, you find this symbolism is pointed out. Revelation, I'm sorry, Ephesians, if you would, the book of Ephesians and chapter 5 and beginning in verse 23. For the husband is head of the wife as Christ is head of the church. And he is Savior of the body. So he talks about the wife, if you follow me, being in the place of the church. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husband, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church. So the church is a symbol of a woman. The church is the symbol of a wife. You see, church equals woman. 
church equals wife. And the Bible makes that symbolism clear. Back in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 1 and 2. Oh, that you would bear with me, he tells the Corinthians a little while. And indeed, I, uh, you do bear with me, for I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy, for I have betrothed you. Who is betrothed? A young woman. I have betrothed you to one husband. So again, he's talking about the Corinthian church as in the place of an affianced bride, an engaged young woman, engaged to be married. That's what the church is pictured as being. I have betrothed you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. So again, church equals woman. Woman equals church in Bible symbolism. Let the Bible interpret its own symbols and not try to read your own ideas into them, as again, many of these so-called Bible experts do. Then the fourth big key... The fourth key that I want to give you here is let the entire Bible, not just these symbols, but let the Bible interpret itself. Now, that's a huge area, and I had to try to narrow that down, or I would go on until 5 o'clock <laughs> as I got to looking at this. There's so many things to say. But that involves everything, as many of you know. Uh, this is a, has huge implications regarding the Ten Commandments and the entire way of life. Let the Bible interpret itself. We go back to, uh, sec to John chapter 10, if you would, at this point. The Gospel of John chapter 10. Here Jesus Christ is speaking, and he's telling the Jews who were mad at him because he said, I'm the Son of God. He said in verse 34, is it not written in your law, referring to their Old Testament, I said, ye are gods. Actually, that was not in the law of part, but he sometimes, again, you let Christ calls the entire Old Testament the law. In this case, it's Psalm 82, verse 6. It's not written. I said, ye are gods. And here the Hebrew word there is Elohim, which can mean judges or mighty judges, or it can literally mean, of course, sometimes angels, and literally means also God, Elohim. The mighty ones, God himself, that's used back in Genesis, the first chapter. I said, ye are gods. If he called them gods to whom the word of God came, these human beings, and the scripture cannot be broken, that's the important thing to remember here. What do you mean? One scripture does not contradict another. Jesus, on this occasion, was talking to very religious Jews, and they said, you're blaspheming because you said this. And so they were trying to say, what does the Bible say? And you're saying something. You know, they, they believed in a God and believed in the Bible to a degree, at least at that point. And so he used their Bible on them. He said, the Bible itself says, ye are gods. And so here am I, backed up by miracles, he goes on to show. And how can you accuse me? Because I use the same symbolism. And the scripture cannot be broken. You can't contradict one scripture with another scripture. You can't do that. You can try, but when you look into the real meaning of the scripture, there's always an explanation. Always an explanation. In the Old Testament, it says, you know, when they committed fornication, so many thousand were killed. And the New Testament says something else. But when you look in the wording of each one, then you can read that one of those two passages, I'm not covering that now, but, but explains that it's not meaning all of them. It, it, you have to read the verses carefully, and they don't contradict each other when you understand them. They do not do that. The Scripture cannot be broken. Do you say of him, then, whom the Father sanctified and sent into the world... You are blaspheming because I said, I am the Son of God. If God himself said, ye are gods. If I do not the works of my Father, don't believe me. But if I do these works, if I'm performing miracles all over this part of the world and even raising the dead, you'd better believe, folks. He went on to show them. And he covered that part in a different way. But the scripture cannot be broken. So brethren, understand that the Bible interprets the Bible. And the scripture does not contradict itself. And if the Bible says something clearly one time, then you'd better be awfully careful to try to say, well, it says something else over here. And yet the Protestant world and the Catholic world, they don't seem to get that. They just go right ahead and make the Bible, in a sense, contradict itself. Did Jesus have one teaching for the Jews and another teaching for the Gentiles? Is that what we read? 
Well, of course, God does not show that. He says back in Romans 2, verse 11, there is no partiality with God. Romans 2, 11, no partiality with God. Is there one way to be saved, or does God have different ways for different groups? That's why, as uh, we've said on this program, when we, we had one by Wally Smith, one of the people auditioning for Tomorrow's World, he had a fine program on the great white throne judgment or on the purpose of, uh, is, is this the only day of salvation? And as I said in my program months ago when I gave one, there's not different ways up to heaven or different ways into the kingdom of God. God has one way. He says, you must believe in the name of Jesus Christ. That name is the only name given, among he given under heaven by which men must be saved. He doesn't have a different way for the Buddhists. He doesn't have a different way for the Mohammedans. They say, well, they just do the best they can over here and the best they can over there. They're all going to get to the same place. Yes, they will get to the same place, but it won't be the kingdom of God. <laughs> it won't be God's kingdom. It won't be Christ's kingdom. Because he says there's only one way. And you don't have that. So you've got to understand the Bible does not contradict itself in all these basic ways. And yet, brethren, just thinking it through as you study and thinking about this as you hear other preachers from time to time and so on, does God contradict himself? Did he have one way for the Jew and another way for the Gentile? Well, quickly consider this thing you've heard us read and often I often go back and use this, perhaps more than anyone else, uh, Matthew 5, 17. Matthew 5, 17, the Sermon on the Mount. Don't think that I came to destroy the law or prophets. I came not to destroy, but fulfill. He says in verse 19, whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments, doesn't make any difference which one you consider least, and teaches men so, he shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. And other scriptures show he won't even be there unless he repents. You know, he just can't keep on breaking them forever once he knows better. But whoever does and teaches them, even the least of the commandments, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Then you read back in Matthew 19, 17, you know, the young man came. Matthew 19, verse 17, good master, what can I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said in Matthew 19, verse 17, if you would enter into life, Keep the commandments, plural. Begin to name some of them. Here is a whole bunch of Jews standing there. They knew what the commandments were. There are ten of them. That's why, you know, we're often said, as James said, if you break one, you break them all. One point of the law. There are ten points. Now, did God himself send along a young man later on to smash all that in the head and contradict everything Jesus told all those tens of thousands of people that he ministered to personally. Did he do that? Well, frankly, no. But again, they'll turn, as they often do, to many scriptures. I'll just give one. Romans, for instance. Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6 from the Apostle Paul. Paul wrote in verse 14, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. And so the good Baptist preacher says, there it is, my brethren, there it is. We're under grace. We don't need a law today. I heard Billy Graham preach the strongest sermon against the law of God I've ever heard in my life over in West Berlin, Germany in September 1960. He had a whole bunch of big black robe Lutheran ministers sitting right behind him. He said, we need, tonight we don't need a law, we need a Savior. We don't need a set of rules, we need someone who died for us. We don't need someone to tell us what to do, we need to someone to show us the way out. And he went on and on and on, because Martin Luther hated law. He thought he was getting away from the Catholic, you know, catechisms and all that, and he got the law of the Catholic Church mixed up with the law of God. And Billy was playing to that audience at that time. No, it doesn't say that. You're not under the law, but under grace. But when you understand what under the law means, and it's used many, many times in this way in the New Testament, it means you're not under the penalty and under the negative authority of the law in some way. What then? He goes on. Again, read right on, and you need to study the whole subject, but even in the passage you can begin to have some doubts about it meaning that because it's directly contradicting what Jesus said. Directly contradicting. And the scripture cannot be broken. What then? Shall we sin? What is sin, brethren? 1 John 3, 4. Sin is. What is it? 
Sin is the transgression of the law. So let's learn to read that in there, the Bible definitions. Shall we then break God's law because we are not under God's law but under grace? Certainly not, Paul says. Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, doulos, bond slaves, to obey, oh, you're going to obey something one way or the other. What are you going to obey? You are that one's slaves whom you obey, whether of sin to death. And he says a little bit later at the end of this very chapter, chapter 6, verse 23, the wages, the reward for sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So, to whom you self present yourselves slaves to obey, uh, whether to sin to death, you see, breaking God's law leads to death, or of obedience to righteousness. Obedience to what? Obedience to your human idea? Obedience to your imagination? Or is this Jew, the Apostle Paul, who is trained as a rabbi, you know, is he talking about God's law, which tells you what to obey? And, of course, I think you know the answer. But you see how they do. They make the Bible contradict itself in massive ways. And yet the Bible does not contradict itself. And that's a very, very important uh, uh, thing to understand. Uh, also, many Protestants and many leading Protestant ministers read right into the Bible over and over and over again their own preconceived ideas about going to heaven or going to hell or the meaning of certain prophecies. My wife and I were hearing John Hagee the other night. He's this uh, big, great, big, perhaps 300-pound Protestant preacher out of San Antonio. And once in a while, I begin to watch, as my friend Mr. Ames does, put him on the spot here, but I think he watches the Inspiration Network occasionally. And I begin to do that because it'll give me an idea of what they're doing there. We're on the Inspiration Network too. And he's a very famous preacher. And frankly, he's very effective. He's a very, very effective Baptist preacher. And he talks about, he said, you do this and you'll go to heaven. And you do that, you'll go to hell, and you've got two roads. You're an immortal soul. You can't die. You're going to live forever. One way or the other, you're going to be around. You're always going to be around throughout all eternity, he said, to the next trillion years. And that's what he said. He used the term trillion, the next trillion years. And you're either going to be in one place or the other. You're going to be in ever-burning hell and writhing in agony, or you're going to be up in heaven. And you've got to decide tonight where you're going to be. Oh, really? <laughs> the wages of sin is death. Is that eternal life in hellfire? Or does death mean death? He doesn't understand that, you see. And Jesus said in John 3, 13, John chapter 3, verse 13, no man has ascended up to heaven. Oh, really? What about John the Baptist, whom he just said was the greatest prophet of all time? What about David, the man after God's own heart? What about all these other great men of God? Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. Abraham, the father of the faithful. Is he down in hell or is he up in heaven? No. John Hagee is blind as a bat. Now, they just read their own ideas into these things, one after the other after the other. I'm reading his book, A Jerusalem Countdown, because I heard it's a very interesting book, which it is, giving some background about the Muslims in Jerusalem and his ideas. But, of course, it has a lot of errors scattered all three through here and on page 29 John Hagee's book he says if Iran you know they're developing the atomic bomb right now if Iran is not stopped in its quest for nuclear weapons the Iranians will have them soon and they will use them against Israel if Iran is stopped it will happen through military force only America and Israel have that power because Russia is now helping Iran to develop their nuclear weapons I believe. Why does he believe this? Well, frankly, it's just directly contradictory to the Bible. And he teaches this on his program. He has whole sections of his book later devoted to it. But here he says it quickly. I believe this military action will lead Russia. Get this. He says Russia will be bringing together a coalition of Islamic nations to invade Israel. The prophet Ezekiel paints that portrait clearly. Where does Ezekiel paint that portrait? In chapters 38 and 39. And he says we'll come to back in section 3 of this book. And where he goes into it in more detail. Is that so? Well of course it's not so. 
the Russians and the, the Arabs are totally opposite. In fact, one of the big things the Russians are terribly worried to right now is this the, the rebellion in Chechnya and all these Islamists are stirred up against them and they have some clients, you want to call them, they're putting a lot of money into in the Middle East to can get their control of the oil. But basically, the Islamists, the Arabs don't like the Russians and they're not going to have any invasion with them at all. The Bible does not say that. But just to see what it does say briefly, which we had all night again, let's turn back to this passage. Turn back to Ezekiel 36. Does the Bible talk about the Russians and all the Arab nations or the Islamic nations coming down to, in a great big army together to attack Israel? And, of course, he shows that's going to be soon, if it happens, before Christ's second coming. I already make that very plain. Is that what's going to happen before Christ's second coming? Or ever happen? No. Ezekiel 36, he says, Therefore say to the house of Israel. And again, I want to come to this point later, but brethren, a huge key to understanding all this is to understand who the house of Israel is. The house of Israel sometimes means all 12 tribes of ancient Israel in their modern setting, or it often means the nations who rebelled, who said to your tents, well, uh, O Israel, and rebelled against the house of Judah. And the main nations of the house of Israel, of course, are Ephraim and Manasseh. They were the leaders and the ten nations that comprised the house of Israel, which was fighting the house of Judah for about 200 years in the Old Testament, over and over. They were fighting each other. They're not the same. Therefore, say to the house of Israel, thus says the Eternal, I do not do this for your sake, O house of Israel, and, and, and bringing them back someday, but for my holy name's sake, uh, which you profaned among the nations. He says in verse 24, I'll take you from among the nations, gather you out of the countries, and bring you into your own land. Well, now that's another thing that Protestants get all mixed up, by the way. They think that this was accomplished in 1948, and they get all emotional. That was the end, the very end of the age, 1948, hallelujah, the, all the Jews came back. And that was the fulfillment of this prophecy. No, it was not. No, it was not. Only a few million Jews, or at first a few hundred thousand, came back. And there, until recently, were more Jews in the United States than all the nation of Israel put together. And additional millions of Jews were in Russia and in other nations of the earth, so that about three-fourths of the Jews lived outside of Israel. So you have to understand that. Most of the Jews did not come back. A lot of the Jews, millions, still have not come back. Most Jews still live outside of Israel, although the greatest single number of Jews in one place live there now. That's just the case I read recently the last year or two. But most in total numbers still live elsewhere. So God did not bring them back in 1948 at all. That group of Jews who came back, you see that in the movie Exodus, was a little precursor, a little type of what God is going to do later when he brings back millions and millions of Americans and British and other Israelites and along with the Jews who also live and are going to go into captivity with us in New York and Chicago and Los Angeles and Beverly Hills where they all live. <laughs> and he's going to bring them back weeping and repenting after Christ comes. That's when they're all going to come back. They did not come back in 1948. Then he says... I will sprinkle you with clean water. You'll be clean, and I will cleanse you from your filthiness. I'll put a new heart and a new spirit within you and take the heart of stone out of your flesh, give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit. Notice what happens. Did this happen in 1948? I'll put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you will keep my judgments and do them. 1948? I've been to Israel about three times, and one of those times was with Mr. Herbert Armstrong in 1972, and we stayed in the Tel Aviv Sheraton right down on the beach, and we were staying over the Sabbath, and we could go back on the back patio or take a quiet walk on the beach, and right down there on the beach were thousands and thousands and thousands of Jews, just like in Santa Monica. These are all Jews, though, in Israel. And they were playing rock music and drinking beer just like the kids from UCLA and USC out in L.A. <laughs> they were not keeping the Sabbath. And all historians and local, you know, the uh, newspaper people, they know that. 
the majority of Jews do not observe the Sabbath even in Israel. They are not keeping God's commandments. They do not have God's spirit. They have not accepted Jesus Christ. And they are not learning God's way. And as God goes on to show here a little bit later, he's going to rebuild them. This land that was desolate, verse 35, has become like the Garden of Eden. And he says in verse 36, Then the nations all around you shall know that I, the Eternal, have rebuilt these ruined places, and so on. Do they know that? No, the Arabs don't even begin to commence to know that. Rather, they're attacking Israel and attacking Israel day and night. Those poor Jews are surrounded by violence. These Arab nations don't know that. This is going to happen after Christ's return. But, you know, Mr. Hagee does know that, and Jerry Falwell, and Pat Robertson, and all these famous guys, they don't know that. They are blinded. They don't get it. I'm not smarter than they are. It's just that God has not called them, but he has called you and me, and if they are right, then you have a whole series of very obvious contradictions. Very obvious contradictions. For God says when the Jews come back or when all the Israel comes back in this prophecy, they're going to have peace and they're going to have God's spirit. And they're going to be blessed and blessed and so forth. No, they're not blessed. They're the most heavily armed nation on earth and they fear day and night. They don't when the next rocket's going to come into their village and blow them up. So it's a whole different picture. But God is going to bring them back later on and bless them. Then in chapter 37, and I won't read all this. Most of you know this story. Here he has the valley of dry bones, and it shows how bone's going to come up to bone. And we know that that is perhaps typical of what he does when he brings Israel back. But the direct fulfillment, the final, is going to be all the house of Israel, typifying the whole world in the great white throne judgment. Verse 11. Then he said, Son of man, here's the ultimate meaning of it. These bones are, this is what God interprets it, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Why does he say whole house? Well, it's not just the ten tribe house of Israel. By then, all the Jews will be with Israel, and they will again be one people. He's going to bring them all back. And then he goes and shows that, and he talks about two sticks. And he says in verse 16, Take for yourself, son of man, one stick, for yourself and write on it for Judah okay you have a stick or a piece of wood up here you scribble on it you know for Judah this one represents Judah and then take another stick and write on it for Joseph the stick of Ephraim get this brethren and all the house of Israel his companions now if you're taking notes here's another key because some of you may get mixed up on this from time to time I used to when I was first learning the truth I thought, well, how do you know these scriptures mean the United States? Which often do. And Mr. Armstrong said, these are talking about us. How do we know they're talking about us? So many of them. Our, our people later on. Or sometimes bad things are going to happen in these scriptures as well. Where it talks about Ephraim. Well, because the word Ephraim. Ephraim was the chief nation of the ten tribed house of Israel. And remember, it was Joseph. But Joseph's two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, were given the great birthright blessings. Well, so when you read Genesis 49, you read Naphtali's a hind het loose or some little verse, and isn't that nice, about all these other nations. And then suddenly you read this great long passage on Joseph. And Joseph is blessed from sea to shining sea. And they're going to be given this and that and something else. The blessings of your ancestors will surpass are these other blessings under the utmost bound of the everlasting hills? He goes on to show about Joseph. Tremendous blessings. The United States and British Commonwealth people have been the greatest single nation and company of nations in the history of the earth. Nothing else is compared with us. The British Empire spread all over the earth, vastly larger than the Roman Empire ever was, and far more power when you consider they had atomic weapons and all the rest of it. And at the height of their power, American Britain could have run, ruled the world. No question if we had wanted to, but it's not in our heart. Again, all those things kind of help identify who we are. We don't want to rule the world. At the end of each war, our young men want to come back and marry their sweetheart and set up housekeeping and have kids and have peace. They don't want to go out killing people and ruling the world. But these other nations, their leaders often having the minds of wild animals, as God describes it, they would keep right on going and grind us down and put us in slave camps, which they're going to do in a few years. A different kind of mind. 
That's why President Jimmy Carter made so many mistakes. He's a good Baptist. He's a really nice fellow. He keeps working to help people, Habitat for Humanity, and, you know, kind of a do-gooder, and that's fine. But he doesn't understand the Bible. It's hard for him to understand that the, the Russians and the Chinese are not good Baptists. Believe me, they're not. <laughs> but he hasn't fully figured that out. There's a whole different mindset. This knowledge of who you are, your ethnicity. Yes, it's not politically correct to talk about that today, but you'd better learn that because it affects everything and is going to affect everything in modern times. So anyway, Joseph being the chief nation of Israel, and Ephraim is the chief nation of Joseph because he showed that the younger brother will be greater than the older brother, Manasseh. Sometimes Ephraim is used as a symbol for the entire house of Joseph, that is Ephraim and Manasseh. And sometimes Ephraim is referring, in fact, to the whole ten-tribed house of Israel. You see what I mean, after they rebelled against the Jews. So he's talking about it in that way. The stick of Ephraim and for all the house of Israel, his companions. Oh, Ephraim represented all ten of them. So one stick was for Judah, representing the people of the descendants of Judah, one of the twelve tribes of Israel, and the Benjamites who went with them, and most of the Levites who went with them. That was the house of Judah. And the house of Judah began to fight the house of Israel for hundreds of years. They had these wars raging back and forth. And the Ephraim represented the ten-tribed house of Israel. All the house of Israel, his companions. So let the Bible interpret the Bible when you read these things. Then join them together into one stick. And he shows what this means. He said, verse 21, Surely I will take the children of Israel from among the nations and bring them down to their own land. And I'll make them, verse 22, one nation in the land on the mountains of Israel. One king shall be king over them all, and they shall no longer be two nations. Israel and Judah, again, will be united as one people. And again, probably a lot of Protestant preachers get sentimental. Oh, is that wonderful? Jesus will be their one king directly. No, he won't. No, he won't. The Bible goes right on to show. He says there'll be one king, and at the end of verse 23, then they shall be my people, and I'll be their God. David, my servant, shall be king over them. So Christ will not be their immediate king. David, resurrected from the dead, will be their king. And they shall all have one shepherd, and walk in my judgments, and observe my statutes, and do them. And at the end of verse 25, my servant David shall be their prince forever. David resurrected from the dead, and certainly Christ will be their overall king. He will be king of kings, Jesus Christ. Who are the other kings? King David and many other kings ruling individual nations under Jesus Christ. So the Bible interprets the Bible on these things and helps you understand what these references are talking about. Then you go on to chapter 38. He's been talking about Christ coming back. And he says in verse 20, uh, first chapter 37, verse uh, 28, Then nations will know that I, the eternal, sanctify Israel when my sanctuary is in their midst forevermore. So he's showing the time setting. When in the time setting? When Christ has come back to earth, the kingdom of God is set up, and Christ is ruling all nations from Jerusalem. And there's a new temple right there. All right, now you introduce chapter 38. That's the next thing to happen. Now, the word of the eternal, is this some Russian war coming down before Christ returns? No, it's after Christ returns. Son of man, set your face against Gog, the land of Magog. Does that sometimes refer to Russia and the prince of Rosh? Yes. Meshach and Tubal and prophesy against him. I'm against you, O Rosh, he says. I'll turn you around and put hooks in your jaw and lead you out on all your army and horses and Persia and Ethiopia uh, and Libya are with them, all of them, shield and helmet. These are other types of uh, nations that are going to apparently cooperate with them, and that would include the, the, uh, the ones that would cooperate with them would be the uh, Iranians, who are Shiites, but the majority, majority of the Arabs are Sunni Arabs, not Shiites. Gomer, Togarma, other areas that refer to, to that area, the former Soviet Union. He says in verse 8 is the key, and after many days you will be visited in the latter years. See, this is after Christ comes. In the latter years you will come back into the land, notice, of those brought back from the sword. 
They have already been brought back from the sword when this happens and gathered from many people on the mountains of Israel. And now all of them dwell safely. Oh, really? All these people of Israel are now back in the land. They've been brought back weeping and repenting, as it tells us back in uh, Jeremiah 31. They come back weeping and repenting, and Christ brings them back and puts them in cities. And it's the land of unwalled villages, having neither bars nor gates, because Christ is here, and they're not afraid, and the kingdom of God is beginning. That's when this takes place. And you will ascend coming up like a storm covering the land. All these Russian, Chinese, Mongolian hordes swoop down on them because they still haven't been really conquered in their attitude. And they think now, even at the beginning of the millennium, it's already begun, probably a few years, they think, we're going to go get these people. You will say, I will go up against a land of unwalled villages. Unwalled villages? Modern Israel? <laughs> the most heavily armed nation on earth? Terrible contradiction here. No, when Israel is brought back, not just the Jews, all of Israel, it's the land of unwalled villages having neither bars nor gates. They don't even bother to lock their front door because Christ is there to take plunder. And you're going to come and try to wipe these people out and you say you're going to get these goods that they've acquired uh, and, and take over the whole nation. Verse 14, therefore prophesy and say, thus says the Lord God on that day when my people Israel dwells safely. The Jews don't dwell safely, but the house of Israel as a whole hasn't even gone back yet. When you dwell safely, you will uh, not know it. Then you will come out from your place out of the far north and bring this massive army, and you will come against Israel like a cloud. Verse 16, it will be in the latter days that I will bring you uh, against my land. So this is right down in the area we call Palestine today, when all Israel has been gathered back there, so that the nations may know God has crushed the beast power headquartered in Rome and Jerusalem by that time and crushed them but the Russian, Mongolian, Chinese hordes further east never got a direct crushing from God. And so they and their arrogance start coming down here. And God says, okay, I'm going to deal with you now. And he humbles them directly at this point after Christ's second coming. And what shows once more who is God. Because even then, if it's thousands of homosexuals and women's livers and many other living on over beyond the tribulation, and if they begin to mutter... And suddenly they realize they're in danger, mortal danger, of this vast army. And then the great creator intervenes once more and shows, I am God. And literally, it takes them seven years to bury the bodies. It's going to be a very humbling experience, even to the people of Israel, some of whom may start to begin to mutter and murmur against God and not be willing totally to learn God's ways. And certainly this vast army coming against them will not have known God. So he says, I'm going to deal with you that you may know me and when I am hallowed in your sight. And uh, so he shows uh, how this is going to happen. And then he goes on to describe more about it. And then he says in verse, uh, not seven years, but seven months, chapter 37, verse 12, chapter 37, verse 12, for seven months, the house of Israel would be burying them. Can you imagine that? Apparently thousands or tens of thousands of men out digging graves to bury this vast army. This is after the millennium begins, and they're going to come swooping down. And then he says, uh, at that time, in verse 21, I will set my glory among the nations. All the nations shall see my judgment. See, he's going to show the world one more time. Who is God? They're going to be willing to listen finally and be humbled which I have executed in my hand when I've laid on them, so that the house of Israel shall know that I am the ever-living one, their God, from that day forward. The Gentiles, okay, the Russian, Chinese, Mongolian horde, and some of the Iranians and a few others have joined with them at that point, shall know that the house of Israel went into captivity for their iniquity, they will then recognize that God did put us in the captivity they will have heard about because the Germans and the Europeans will have done that. They've been on the periphery. But now law begin to dawn on them when Christ comes back and sets up his kingdom. They're going to learn why it was done, why we went into captivity. If 
for their iniquity because they were unfaithful to me. Therefore, I hid my face from them. And my brethren, lots of these people who are blind and, and deceived and even arrogant and are getting into their iniquity. And as the latest uh, bulletin brings out, it's terrible to even think about it. But now they're talking, as you know, and read about that, that news section about animalism and bestiality. Now there are whole groups advocating that in various parts of the world. First, fornication, adultery, then homosexuality. Then what's the next level? What's the next thing you can get into? Animals. Our nation is sick. Our Western world is sick. And God's going to shake us like a rag doll to wake us up. So he says, they're going to finally know who I am. And the Gentiles shall know the house of Israel went in because of our sins, and he hid his face from us. He will not hear the prayers of these people who have not been obeying his commandments. I gave them into the hand of their enemies, and they all fell by the sword. And then he says, verse 30 or verse uh, 25, Therefore says God, now I will bring back the captives of Israel and have mercy on the whole house of Israel and be jealous for my holy name after they've borne their shame. When I brought them forth from the peoples and gathered them out of their enemies' hands, verse 28, then they shall know that I am the eternal their God who sent them into captivity among the nations, but also brought them back into their own land and let, left none of them captive anymore. So by this time he will have brought them back. And I will not hide my face from them anymore. Thank God for that. Finally, when these good Baptists and people around here really repent, God will hear their prayers and he will bless them and bless them and guide them and they'll understand and they'll say, wow, I just didn't realize that because most of them don't, of course. They've had false ministers, they've been blinded and they don't understand. So then he's going to help them understand and I will not hide my face from them anymore for I shall have, you see, as he brought them back, poured out my spirit on the house of Israel, says the eternal God. This is what happens after Christ returns, not before Christ returns. And, of course, these men and their writings and their imaginations get all these things uh, mixed up. All right, that is a major key. Now, the next final key, key number five, is Israel's identity. To really understand the Bible, brethren, Please go back, and you brethren around the world, if you have any doubts or if it's not real clear to you, please, for your sake, go back and read and reread Mr. O'Gwen's wonderful booklet describing the United States and Great Britain and Bible prophecy. Read that booklet. Study that booklet. Dr. Monell has been giving us additional information and will continue to do so in articles and sermons as he's looking into this as a special hobby also, which is very important. This identity that the house of Israel and the house of Judah became two separate peoples and the house of Israel led by Ephraim are peoples of the United States and the British Commonwealth nations today. We have been given the greatest blessings of any peoples in human history. We are that one great nation and that great company of nations described over and over again in the book of Genesis. We are that people that God said he would give the gates of our enemies to us, and he's done that. And as I've described several times, most of those gates are gone. We're already going down the toboggan slide, and the slide is getting deeper and deeper as we go along. So let's understand. It's a tremendous key to understand that. This key helps us know who we are and to understand our present world condition. This key helps us avoid the misunderstandings about 1948 about Russia coming back early and all this other stuff. This key helps us give the Ezekiel warning to our people so they can be told who you are and wake up while there's yet opportunity and apply the scriptures to us and to our people properly, which the world cannot do. If Pat Robertson understood it, he'd probably have a lot of it on his, you know, 700 Club and maybe more effective. He's got more money, he's got more equipment. He'd put it out there with film clips and make it exciting. God help us to do that more as God gives us the effectiveness. It may not be his fault. Some of those guys are not called. But we do understand, and we've got to warn our people. And this understanding of who we are helps us understand thoroughly about one-fourth of the entire Bible, which is prophecy. Jesus said we're to live by every word of God. So let's understand and appreciate what we have. 
turn now to John, if you would, the Gospel of John, brethren. John chapter 6 to verse 53. John 6, verse 53. Jesus said, Most assuredly I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh, again, the Bible interprets the Bible. You see, you can say, well, you have eternal life already. No, you have it in you through the Holy Spirit. But he goes on in the last half of the verse to say, I'll raise you up at the last day. Keep on reading. The Bible interprets itself. For the, my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. If we drink into this book, if we feed on Christ, he lives in us. And apart from that, brethren, he cannot live within us because we don't have his thoughts. We don't have his mind. This is the revelation of the mind of God. It is powerful. It is magnificent. Many, many thousands of men and women have died directly or indirectly to preserve this book. And we should be very grateful for it. As the living Father has sent me, and I live because of the Father, so he who feeds on me will live because of me. We've got to feed on Christ by studying and really studying and going over this book and reading it regularly. In verse 63, it is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. No, it's fun to watch TV, it's fun to go to the movie, it's fun to buy another car, it's fun to eat more, it's fun to do this and that. Yes. Is that going to save you? No. It's all gone pretty soon. It's all gone. So he says, these things profit nothing, these things of the flesh. The words that I speak to you are spirit, and they are life. They will live forever. And if they live in you because you feed on Christ, study Christ's word, study the Bible, drink in of it, masticate it, chew it, turn it over in your mind, meditate about it, pray about it, act on it, you also will live forever.